I'm in this crazy place where my world is spinning wild, but I feel you all around. I think I'm out of answers, and I don't know your plans, but I will trust you now. Yeah, sometimes I don't know, and it's alright. I'm kinda lost in the low, but it's just life. Through the ebbs and the flows, like how far we've come. And I know everything will be just fine. Cause I'm yours, and I know you are all mine. Wanna stay, cause your love is all I've found. Since I'm lost without true, cause your love is so true. This is where I belong.
something about I wanna hear you shouting go birthday every day's a good day now let me tell you why if you got air in your lungs you got blood in your body you are a child of god come on and sing it somebody Well, good evening, White Flag. Come on, let's stand to our feet. And we're here tonight to worship our God, to praise Him, to leave everything aside. Our God loves us. So come on, if you know this song, help me sing it. Remember those. Remember those walls that we call sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But He came and He died and He rose. Those walls are rubble. Stay up. Come on, remember those giants. Remember those giants we call death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came and he died and he rose. Those giants are dead now. Come on, this is our God. He loves us. Come on, we sing. This 
Welcome to each of you, whether you're watching online or you're in the building with us, we are glad you're worshiping with us this evening. If you're a guest here, we would love to invite you and your family to connect with our church through our guest card that you can find in the seat next to you or by scanning the QR code. In either case, you can take it across the hallway after guest ser- or after service to our guest central uh, area and exchange it for a free gift. It's just our way of saying thank you for hanging out with us tonight. Well, maybe you've been visiting our church for a little while now and you're interested in taking your next steps with our church. If that's you, we want to invite you to our next starting point class, which is happening this Sunday. You can hear directly Directly from Lead Pastor Paul, we have a meal for you and free child care. You can find all of that information and sign up for the Starting Point class on the White Flag app. Well, maybe you've taken the Starting Point class and you've been around for a little while and you're interested in growing in your relationship with Jesus and becoming strong as a disciple. Well, I want to invite you to our next White Flag Strong class that's kicking off on May 5th. This is your opportunity to see and grow in your relationship with Jesus and as his disciple. You can find, again, more information about that and sign up for that class on the White Flag app. 
Well, every year here at White Flag, we do a child dedication service. Uh, This is just your opportunity as a parent of new and young children to partner with our church and commit before this body of believers that you are going to raise your child in a godly household and teach them uh, the truths of Scripture. If that is something that you want to participate in, I encourage you again to go to the White Flag app, or you can talk to anyone in our family ministry department about more information about when that's happening and what exactly goes on. You can also sign up for that on the White Flag app. Well, lastly tonight, we just want to say thank you for giving of your tithes and offerings. It allows us to partner with missionaries all across the world and see ministry go on in all sorts of contexts. So again, thank you for doing that. And if you haven't had the opportunity to give yet this week, you can do so through the White Flag app or by stopping by any one of our giving boxes. And speaking of missions tonight, I want to take just a moment to invite you to stay seated as we hear a missions update from our lead pastor, Paul, and our elders. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome again to church. Glad that you guys are here. Wanted to take just a a few moments here at the beginning of the service to introduce you uh, to some of our missionaries and to uh, allow you to, with us, pray for them as they are about to head back into the field. And so uh, when you read through Scripture and you uh, hear about, uh, you know, Paul and Barnabas and and all those guys going out and spreading the gospel, you know, you might think that's something that just happened in Bible days and Bible times, but it actually uh, is supposed to be happening all the time. And so our church supports all kinds of different missions uh, all over the world. And uh, tonight, uh, I want to introduce you to Aaron and Carissa Othick, uh, who are not missionaries from some far off place, but they're actually partially homegrown right here in our church. Uh, Aaron grew up in this church. I think you were here before I was here. As a little, a little bit, yeah, yeah, as a little child. Uh, Aaron uh, grew up in this church. Uh, his sister is on our staff. Uh, his parents have been involved. Um, his, his brother attends. Uh, so they're a part of our family. And uh, by way of marriage, you now are a part of our family. Um, but uh, they are a part of a, a mission uh, uh, organization called Pioneer Bible Translators. And what they do is... Uh, They take the Bible and they translate it into a language for a people group who don't have access to the Word of God in their own language. So there are dedicated people who are super smart. uh, I guess they're called linguistic people, you know. And they and they work at just taking parts of the Bible and getting it into that native language. And so uh, there's an an entire support system then around that because you can't just translate something and go here. Uh, There has to be someone to teach that and disciple people, and that's where these guys come in. So they're about to head out to the field for a couple of years uh, into South Asia, and I was going to let Aaron tell you a little bit about that. Thanks, Paul. Um, Yeah, as Paul was saying, we've been serving, uh, preparing to serve, and and have gone for our first term, um, serving with Pioneer Bible Translators in a Muslim context in South Asia. Um, We serve there with a team that is translating God's Word into uh, a language group that doesn't have the Bible and that has about 10 million mostly Muslim speakers. Um, our first term there is, uh, you know, we're fairly new uh, overseas. We've spent most of the time, like children, learning a new language all over again, um, learning to adapt and survive in a new culture, um, and, and building relationships with the local church, the small church that's there, and with our, our Muslim neighbors. Um, As we go back, we are excited to get to um, work on starting to distribute the newly translated portions of Scripture uh, and doing that in support of the local church that exists, um, as well as using them to to share the gospel, the good news about Christ, with so many of our neighbors who've never heard of him or have a a skewed idea of who Jesus was. Um, And we do all of that just with a, a sense of gratitude from White Flag, the leadership in this congregation that um, have supported and partnered with us. Um, And we also are so grateful for your prayers uh, that go before us and and make all of this work fruitful uh, because it couldn't be done by us alone. 
Yeah, cool. So you guys, whether you're known or not, if you tithe and give to this church, uh, your support, this is just one of those ministries uh, that you might not ever know that's going on, but it's going on. And that's why when we can, we like to put them in front of you. Uh, and so we're going to have uh, our elders pray for them now, and I would invite you to pray along. And uh, don't just pray for them tonight, but as you think uh, when you see something on the news, when you hear something about some Muslim country, when you, when you, you know, uh, interact with somebody and you hear something about Asia, uh, always use that as a little trigger to go, wait a minute, we've got people there and we've got people doing work for the Lord and uh, you can lift them and continue to lift them up in prayer. So let's go ahead and pray for these guys, if you guys would pray. All right, well, Heavenly Father, uh, we just come to you tonight and we just uh, thank you for Aaron and Carissa and their family and the work that they're doing uh, across the, the globe, Father. Uh, they, are, they have servants' hearts, Father, and they're, uh, we just ask that you bless their work, help them be, be effective. We, we just uh, are grateful to know that they're uh, working with Bible translators and spreading the good news uh, over uh, in their new location, Father. We just ask that their work is effective. We just ask for your protection on their hearts and their souls and their minds. We ask that you protect their family, Father, and we just uh, uh, ask that you... Uh, Help them to have a, a great impact for the kingdom over there. And we just ask for their safe return when it's all said and done. And we just lift this up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Father God, thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for the Othic family. We thank you for their young family that's been challenged to do this work, God. And I just pray that as they go back over, that you would give them strength uh, and courage and wisdom as they make decisions and work with a team over in this Muslim country, Father. And I just thank you that uh, your word goes out everywhere. It doesn't return void. And we just pray for the, their, their kiddos as they bring them back into the field, that you protect them and keep them and nurture them and bring them up in your word. And we just thank you for the great work that uh, their parents are doing. And then we pray for this congregation that you, uh, as, as Pastor Paul said, that you prompt us to constantly be remembering and lifting them up in prayer, not only them, but the other uh, missionaries that we support across the world. We thank you for what you're doing. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, would you guys stand up and find one or two people that you have not yet met? Say hello to them and let's then get into worship. Thanks, guys. Well, come on, church. We lift our voices tonight. There's no one better than our God. Come on, help us sing. Satisfied 
Church, tonight I want to, before we do this last song, I want to read a scripture to you. This last song is called, Who Else is Worthy? And that's why we're gathered here tonight. There's so many opportunities throughout the week to be focused on something else, to put something else on the throne, to give something else glory, or to make something else worthy of praise. But can I just propose to you tonight, there is nothing, there is no one more worthy of praise than Jesus Christ. Amen, church? Amen. And so Revelations 4, Revelation 4, 11, here's what it says. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So we're here tonight to worship a God who spoke and all of this came into existence. And he is worthy of our praise, church. So let's lift our voices tonight as we sing this together. So come on, help us sing. I am an instrument of exaltation. And I was born to lift your name above all names. You hear the melody of all creation. There's a song of praise that only I can bring. Who else is worthy?
to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Sing that one more time. For Jesus paid it all. And oh, to Him I owe. Sin church all over this room. If you're thankful for the saving grace of Jesus, give him some praise. Amen. There are two books in the Bible that begin with the phrase, in the beginning. The first is Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the second is John 1-1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John then later writes to follow that statement up, that that Word that was in the beginning became flesh and dwelt among us. You see, God's eternal son, Jesus, was the one who was at the beginning of all of creation. He was the mode in which all of creation was made through, and he was the reason all of creation was made for. But we know the story of Jesus doesn't just end as an eternal creator, but because we as humans messed everything up by sinning against a very holy God, the very word of God, Jesus, chose to step out of heaven and become flesh and dwell among us. He lived like us. He became like us. He felt like us and experienced like us. But most importantly, he died for us. And that's why every week we take just a moment to pause for communion, to remember God as an eternal creator over everything and to worship him for that, but also to remember Jesus as the perfect sacrifice for all sins and the perfect redeemer for all people. So tonight, let's do that. Let's worship our God who is a creator by remembering his son Jesus who sacrificed and gave up his life for you and for me so that our sins could be atoned for and that we could have eternal life as we place our faith and trust in him. I'm gonna pray for us and then we are gonna spend just a few moments remembering Jesus during communion. God, we come to you just worshiping you as the God over all things, the universe, this world, but even our lives, that you are the God who leads us, you are the God who died for us. And so, Father, we worship you because of Jesus' sacrifice, that he chose to step out of heaven and live like us. That way he could be the perfect and final sacrifice for all sin. So, Lord, we pray that you would just receive all of the honor and all of the glory and praise tonight as we remember Jesus and the sacrifice he made on our behalf. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Well, good evening again. Welcome, everybody. Glad that you're here. Welcome to our guests and welcome to our uh, audience who watches online and everybody who's live in the room. Glad that you're here. Uh, God is so good. I'll tell you, we've got a lot to celebrate at our church. We're in a season where God seems to be really moving. You know, people will use a real vague language like that, like God's up to something or God's moving. And I, I actually don't like that language. Uh, I like to be more specific. So when I say God's really up to something or he is really moving, I want to say specifically, we've seen so many lives change at our church over the last two weeks that it's pretty mind-boggling. I had mentioned last week that on Easter weekend we had 40 people who gave their life to Christ and they were immediately baptized. Well, last week we ended up having 12 more people give their life to Christ and get baptized. So that's something to celebrate. And and we've already got two more people who are scheduled uh, this week uh, to be baptized with their family, uh, watching, uh, representing, uh, or, you know, they're representing through their baptism the decision that they've made to surrender their life to Christ. And so uh, I'm telling you folks, that does not happen in some churches uh, to have whatever that is, 40, 52, 54, if, you know, and there might be more before the weekend's over, but to have 54 people's lives change, there are some churches that don't see that many people come to Christ in a two or three year period, much less in a two week period. And so let me emphasize that's not because uh, we are doing something uh, extraordinary, it's that God is doing something. God is the one that draws people uh, into a relationship with Himself. And so I just share that to say, you know, if you're praying for someone or if you're hoping a family member or a friend uh, will come to clarity, don't give up praying for them because God is always moving and uh, you just never know, but uh, don't give up. So good things are happening and uh, we are in a very exciting series that we've been going through now for uh, well over a year, believe it or not. We are walking through the gospel of Mark and uh, if you don't know what that means and you're new to church, what that means is... We are taking just one book of the Bible. There are four Gospels. We're taking the, the first Gospel that was written, the Gospel of Mark, and we're reading it from the very beginning, every word, all the way to the end, and we're taking the time to understand every sentence. And that is a, an extraordinary uh, journey to do and to take, uh, but it's been very uh, exciting and uh, really uh, rewarding for me, and I hope it has been for you. But to summarize where we're at, I, I can't summarize the whole thing, or it would take all night, but I can say we've looked at Jesus' life and ministry all the way up to his final week. And it's the final week of his life, uh, a very busy week. We've watched him come into the city of Jerusalem. They, they threw, there were some folks there that threw a parade, if you will, for them and claimed to believe that he was the Messiah and celebrated him. But then they quickly dissipated. And, and, and then you have Jesus going into the temple and he confronts the hypocrisy and the evil that's taking place in his father's house and he flips over the tables of the money changers and he corrects all the the wrong thinking and teaching and mindset and he does miracles and he continues to teach he's been working with his disciples he's just had a a special meal with them that was a Passover meal that he kind of flipped the, uh, the, the script on and turned it into the Last Supper, which was all about him and focusing on him and what he was going to do and accomplish. Uh, and in the midst of that, uh, there was talk of betrayal. He ends up, uh, they call it a night, and they head to the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's where we were last week, in the garden where uh, we were uh, observing Jesus as he experienced all kinds of trouble and distress and sorrow to the point of death, if you remember. Well, today's text is going to reveal that there is still more for Jesus to endure in the garden. There's still one other thing that's got to happen in the garden that's not going to be pleasant. And uh, that is uh, the act of betrayal literally taking place. And that's what our text is for today. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to open up to Mark chapter 14. We're going to be looking at just verses 43 through 52 today. Uh, and it's a shorter account, uh, but a very powerful one. So Mark 14, verses 43 through 52. Let me begin by reading uh, the, script, uh, the, the Scripture in its entirety. Then we'll pray and get started. All right? So let's focus in here. Mark writes, Just as he, Jesus, was speaking... Judas, 
one of the twelve appeared. Now with him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Well, going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come at me with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you, teaching in the temple courts, and you didn't arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Now this is a, what I would describe a, a really segmented and choppy uh, version of the night's events. Mark is brief often in his descriptions of things. He's moving through things quicker than some of the other gospel writers. And what we're reading about here today is a fascinating uh, section that is going to require us to dip into the other gospels so that we can get a, a more complete picture of everything that went on in this last few moments in the garden and that's what we're going to do. Uh, so let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll go back to the top, and we'll unpack this verse by verse, all right? Let's pray. God, uh, I'm so thankful that we get to have this time tonight. Uh, this is such a, a precious time that we get to spend in your word, and so um, I pray, Father, that as we uh, focus on this tonight, that uh, we'll give you all of our attention. Uh, I pray that uh, everyone that's here can set aside the distractions of their week, uh, maybe what they've already gone through or what they think is going to happen uh, maybe before the week is up, and that they could just sit in your presence tonight and, and study your word. I, I pray for not only those distractions, but I, I pray for our church to be disciplined in this time of study that uh, people will stay seated and uh, not get up and leave to go to the bathroom. They won't be looking at their phones. They won't, they won't be uh, distracted by the things that are not important and miss uh, the great value of the wisdom of your word. And so I give you this time, and, and I've prepared, Father, and I pray now that you uh, would speak through me. These would be your words, not just mine. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would move in everyone's hearts to help them hear and learn and grow. It's in your son's name that I pray. Everybody says? Amen. Amen. All right, so as I said, this is a pretty brief uh, section that we get to really focus in on the details of today, and uh, we will be dipping into uh, some other areas. But let's look at verse 43 and start there. Uh, Mark writes that just as he was speaking, and this, of course, is referring to Jesus, and remember, last week we, we ended with Jesus had gone and prayed, came back, found his disciples sleeping. He went and prayed again, came back, found them sleeping. He kept saying, hey, stay focused, don't be distracted, you know, be praying with me, but they kept falling asleep. And he came back for the third and final time, and that's when he basically said, hey, enough, all right? Uh, I know uh, my betrayers are coming, and it's go time. And it literally, in the middle of that sentence... Uh, just as he was speaking, is verse 43, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. This is an interesting uh, way to say this. Mark is emphasizing the level of betrayal once again. That it was one of his own disciples. And what I find interesting is there's no attempt uh, made to cover up the disgrace, if you will, of being betrayed by a friend, right? Like, that's not a super cool thing. That's not a, that doesn't help you if you're trying to convince people that Jesus truly is the Messiah and you're writing a, a, a documented book about him to say, yeah, one of his closest friends didn't even believe he was a Messiah after hanging out with him for three years and was willing to betray him. Right? That doesn't make real good sense to put that in there, and it, it, it would be tempting to leave that out. Right? But 
the gospel writers and throughout the New Testament, they're not afraid to include that in, that one of the 12 is responsible for the betrayal of Jesus. And also, I want to mention uh, something that I've already mentioned. Let's not forget the lesson that we learned from Judas. And the lesson is that close proximity to Jesus doesn't guarantee a transformed life. I talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Does it doesn't matter that you're close to Jesus. Judas spent every waking second with Jesus for three years, and it made no difference in his life whatsoever. And you can show up to church every Thursday night and, and tell everyone that you know Jesus, uh, but if you don't have a true relationship with Jesus where you're pursuing him and submitting to him and loving him, uh, you don't have a relationship with him. So, uh, verse 43 starts there, and then it continues. It says, With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders. Now, Mark only tells us who sent the crowd. You've got to read that carefully, or you'll think, this is who's in the crowd. But that's not who's in the crowd. The, the three groups represented here uh, are what make up the Sanhedrin, uh, the, the, the court of the land, if you will, and they're just the ones responsible for sending another group of people to go arrest Jesus. They're, they're going to send someone else to do the dirty work, right? Now, there may have been some officials mixed in there, but when you put everything together with the other gospel accounts, we know who make up the crowd. Uh, we have a, uh, several officers of the temple guard, guys that were in, in charge of the temple grounds, some police officers, if you will, of the temple area, and also Roman soldiers. We know there are Roman soldiers in this crowd, which is a new, a new tweak, right? a new twist, if you will. Why are the Roman soldiers getting involved here? Well, because the Jewish religious leaders can't kill Jesus without the government involvement. Right, Because Rome is ultimately in charge. So this is where we see them getting Rome involved because what they're trying to do is kill Jesus. They don't just want to beat him up. They don't want to just embarrass him. They don't want to just put him on trial and lock him away. They want to execute him. And they need Rome's support in that manner. So there's some Roman soldiers there as well. And this crowd, it says, comes with weapons, clubs, and swords. Some of the other accounts tell us that there were also torches and lanterns. So we've got like a, a lynch mob coming through uh, this garden to arrest Jesus. Now look at verse 44. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So, so Judas is saying, I'm going to kiss somebody. That's your man. And then lock him down. You know, get them, get them in cuffs, get them under guard. Let's get them and let's get out. Okay. Now, notice the vibe here. Everything is being done by the cover of darkness. This is in the middle of the night, if you will. It's the early morning hours, but we would say, you know, it's the middle of the night. Complete darkness. The Jewish leaders have always been worried about how the public would react if they arrested Jesus because a lot of the public liked Jesus' teachings and his miracles because they were looking to get something out of Jesus. And so uh, they have chosen an isolated, private place uh, where they could catch him and by the cover of darkness. And so a signal has been arranged to identify Jesus and I think, to allow things to go as smoothly and low-key as possible, right? Like, you know, we, we don't want to draw attention, so let's come up with a signal that kind of allows this to go smoothly. Um, another way to look at it is if, if in our day and age, you know, there were some police officers that were going to come up on a, you know, criminal or a suspect, there, there are two ways to come in at this guy. Rolling in hot with the sirens blaring, and guns drawn, and you know, everybody get down. Or, you know, you come in with the sirens low, and you're strategic because you don't want it to, to get out of hand. They're coming in uh, like the latter. Now, why the need to identify Jesus and have a signal at all? Can't they just walk in there and go, well, there's Jesus? Well, if you think that 
based on all of the pictures you've seen of Jesus like this, glowing with a glow around him, with long blonde hair and blue eyes, like they had a, you know, a photo of him, or, you know, he was a real bright, you know, star looking like thing in the middle of the night. That's not the way this was going down, and that's not reality. Remember, the scriptures teach us and tell us that there was nothing special about the way Jesus looked. It goes out of the way, uh, the scriptures go out of their way to say he was just ordinary and there was nothing extraordinary about the way he looked. So it's dark, there's a bunch of Jewish dudes in a garden and they can't see and it's important to get the right guy so they need to be sure. And so they've got a plan. The kiss is a perfect signal because it was the typical way that a student would greet their rabbi. I mean, you've seen cultures where people go up and they're, mwah, mwah, they do the kissing thing. We don't do that in America. We think that's weird, but most cultures do that. And uh, it was very standard affair for a student to greet their rabbi this way. So it would be not unusual. Judas has got up and left that table earlier, a few hours ago. And, you know, he's coming back. And again, remember the disciples don't know anything about, like they don't understand that Judas is the betrayer believe it or not, because they didn't have a book that told them how it all went down. They're just living in the moment. And so this kiss would allow for a quick identification of Jesus and less drama. He would just walk in, you know, Jesus, rabbi, kiss, kiss, boom, they know who, and they can grab Jesus. Well, that's the plan. Now, uh, look at verse 45. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, rabbi, and kissed him. So it's happened now. Now let's not miss the uh, proverbial twisting of the knife that happens with this kiss. Because it's not just a kiss. It is utter betrayal. Because not only is he selling his friend, master, and teacher out, but he's using a kiss which is normally a sign of affection and respect to betray Jesus. Like there's, there's some double, like, you know, twisting of the betrayal knife in that. Um, and, and here's another interesting thing. The Greek word that Luke uses in his gospel for kiss indicates that it was a long, uh, you know, pronounced and drawn out kiss. And you say, well, what does that look like and what does that mean? Well, uh, here's the best way I can describe it, and I think I've described it this way in another sermon years ago. Um, if you've ever seen The Godfather, and I know I've I used this to, to explain it before, but like, if you haven't, don't watch it. I shouldn't even tell you that I watch it, but, you know. <laughs> it's a movie from the 70s, and uh, uh, Michael Corleone, who, who's this you know, guy in the movie, uh, has been betrayed by his brother, Fredo. And they're at their mother's, I think they're at their mother's funeral. I can't, I, I can't remember. I think they're at their mother's funeral or somebody. No, they're not at their mother's funeral. I don't know where they're at because I think the mother's still alive. Uh, but they're somewhere. Maybe they are at the mother's funeral. I should have looked this up. But anyway, <laughs> that's not even important. He, I'll figure it out for Sunday. He <laughs> is at the funeral. They're both in the room. The betrayal, he knows that his brother betrayed him. So when he sees his brother, he doesn't go up to him and say, you betrayed me, and now I'm going to kill you. What he does is he goes up to his brother, and he puts both of his hands on his face and kisses him and looks him right in the eye, nose to nose, kisses him and pulls his head back and says something to the effect of, I know it's you, Fredo. I know it's you. And, you know, as soon as our mother's dead and she's not around to see it, I'm going to kill you. And it's this really intense moment. What makes it so intense is him holding his face, and he's inches away from his face, and it's brother to brother. So I, I, I should have researched that a little bit better in my head, but that's what I would say to describe this. You know, there's no comparison. This is a made-up movie. This is real life. But, but Judas has come in and kiss Jesus, and it's a prolonged kiss in their culture, 
probably on the cheek, but they're face to face. And it's not just I'm betraying you and I'm going to do it in the cover of darkness, but I'm betraying you and I'm going to look you right in the eye when I do it. And that had to have some real intensity. Because remember, you know, Jesus knew that this was going to happen and now it is going down. Well, verse 46 says, the men then seized Jesus and arrested him. They seized him and they arrested him. Now, let's, let's press pause right here because Mark is leaving out some really incredible details. Um, and, and that's okay. That's why there are four accounts of the gospel. God inspired four people to write four different angles of the life and ministry of Jesus. And so John gives us a detail here that Mark doesn't, and we just got to go there and read it and spend some time there. And remember, John was actually there that night. In fact, John is with Peter, James, and John are praying with Jesus uh, right there in the garden. The rest of the disciples are somewhere else in the garden, but they're right here. So John's got a front row seat of this, and listen to what he shares in John 18, verses 4 through 7. Now, this is at the exact same moment um, uh, that we're reading here, but it's before, you know, it's before the kiss. John 18, 4, 7. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out to the crowd and asked them, Who is it that you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And John notes, and Judas the traitor was standing there with the crowd. Verse 6, when Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, Jesus asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Now, if this is your first exposure to this, you might not catch how powerful of a moment this is. So let me explain what, what happened here and why Mark didn't include it, I don't know. But John does give it to us. This crowd has come up on Jesus and they got their swords and they got their clubs and they got their torches and they're ready to, to grab Jesus. They, they just, you know, they're just getting there. And we get to see Jesus for just a split second and just a very minor way demonstrate his power. Just a glimpse of his power. They want to know who's Jesus of Nazareth and Jesus says, I am he. Now, in the original Greek, uh, the word he doesn't appear. The only thing that's in the Greek is I am. You know what I am is? I am is the name of God. When, when, when God interact with, uh, interacted with Moses in the Old Testament, he said, you tell him I am sent you when you go to Pharaoh. God's name, according to God, is I am. So what Jesus does here is answers I am, meaning I am God. And just at the sound of his name, it knocks the whole group of men on the ground. Now think about that. They come in ready to arrest him. He says, I am he. Boom, they fall back and on the ground. I want to know what did they think just happened? Was it like, a coincidence that we all tripped. Did the first guy, you know, some people try to explain it away. The first guy tripped and like dominoes, they all went down. Or maybe there was an earthquake right at that moment and had nothing to, no. This is the power of the name of God being spoken and being in the presence of God. And it's like Jesus went like this. I am fully human, but let me just show you who I am. And if I just, you know, give you my pinky, boom, you guys wouldn't even be able to handle it. And so what does this all show us? It shows us that Jesus is absolutely in control and is limiting his power and allowing things to happen, which we've been talking about over and over again through this whole uh, study. Now, that's in John's gospel. And I hope that shows you the richness of you don't just read one gospel. You start there, but then you read them all because you get all these details and you can put them together and you get a real full picture uh, that you wouldn't get if you just read one. Now, let's get back to our text in Mark. 
Um, this is uh, the last time that Mark is going to mention Judas. And Judas has come in, he's betrayed Jesus, and you know, that's the end of it in, in our study. But you know, a brief explanation, from other accounts, we know what happens to Judas. If you don't know, well, Judas you know, betrays Jesus, uh, he leaves there. Uh, the Bible tells us he was filled with remorse, which is a little bit confusing because it sounds like when you're filled with remorse, usually you would what? Repent. But he doesn't repent. He's filled with remorse. He realizes he's betrayed an innocent man. That's what he says. And he goes to the religious leaders with that silver, the 30 pieces of silver. And he's like, I, I shouldn't have done this. And they're like, I don't care. We've used you and we're we got our man. We just were using you anyway, so you can take it or leave it, right? He throws the money down, and, and then he goes and hangs himself. And he doesn't even know how to do that right. Uh, he hangs himself. His body falls, it tells us, I think, in Acts, and his body bursts open, and it says his intestines spilled out. That's the end of Judas. And I'm, I mean, those aren't details I'm just making up. That's word for word what it says in in, in, the, in the scriptures. So, you know, it, it, it's hard to sort that out because why, you know, if you're filled with remorse, just repent. Go try to find Jesus. Get to the crowd. Fight your way to the front and say, Jesus, I'm sorry. Yell it out to him. Go find one of the other disciples and say, what do I need to do? Listen, uh, if you do something wrong and you feel bad about it, I think, a lot of people think, okay, that's all I need to do. No, no, you don't just feel bad about something. You need to repent, and you need to fix it. And, and sometimes you're limited in how you can fix it, but fixing it has to involve some way you expressing uh, repentance to the person that you hurt or betrayed or you know, stole from or whatever the situation might be. So that's the end of Judas um, uh, as far as Mark goes here. But look at verse 47. This, this, this just gets more and more interesting. So verse 47 says, then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Mark doesn't tell us any more details than that. But John identifies the sword swinger. Who do you think it is? It's Peter. Good old Peter. Peter. <laughs> Peter never leaves us without something awesome to make fun of. Uh, Peter, uh, it's Peter, yeah, and, you know, it's, it's just classic, uh, which I'll get to in a moment, but John also gives us the identity of the man Peter attacked. Uh, not just that it's the servant of the high priest, but his name is Malchus. Now, Peter, you know, in the middle of this, pulls out a sword and tries to murder a dude, misses and lops his ear off. Why? Well, if you think about what I told you last week, what we studied through, it makes perfect sense. Jesus just told Peter, very specifically, you're going to betray me. And Peter's like, no, I'm not. Maybe everybody else will. I would never betray you. In fact, I would die for you. And Jesus is like, no, you won't. You're going to deny me. Remember, before the rooster crows twice, three times, today, in fact, specifically, tonight. So Peter is real focused on looking for an opportunity to prove himself. He's told Jesus, I won't mess up. Jesus says, you will. And here's his chance to go, no, I told you I'd die for you. Let's go. And he swings at a dude and cuts his ear off. Now, the problem is this. This isn't about Peter this moment is not about Peter. And Peter and his insecurities uh, has got him injecting himself into a situation. Now, if we go to some other gospel uh, parts, uh, John and the book of Matthew and Luke, we get all kinds of added information that Mark doesn't give us. So, for example, John 18, 11 says this, Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? And you know from last week, because I taught you, remember, the wrath of God for sin comes out of the cup. 
Symbolically, the language is anytime you hear drink of the cup, it's the wrath of God. Jesus is saying, if there's any way this cup can be passed from me. And now he's saying to Peter, Peter, put your sword down. I'm supposed to experience the wrath of God on the cross so that you, my friend, don't have to spend eternity in hell. He, he doesn't say that, that, but that's what is the vibe of this conversation. Now, Matthew gives us a, a whole little section. I could preach a three-point sermon just on what Jesus says to Peter. Like, even, And this is what I find fascinating. In the moment of Jesus' worst despair and sorrow and reality starting to play out, he's still coaching Peter. That's how bad Peter is. And, and go to Matthew 26, 52 through 54, and listen, listen to this three-point sermon. I wrote a little three-point sermon based on it. Here we go. First of all, verse 52 Jesus says, put your sword back in its place, Jesus said, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword, okay? Or another way, it's trans- live by the sword, die by the sword. So w- lesson number one, Jesus is just throwing in a quick lesson about consequences. Hey, Peter, if you kill this guy with a sword, they're going to kill you. There are going to be four crosses on Golgotha, and you're going to be up there with me. You, you, you can't just kill people. Or then people will want to kill you. You live by the sword, you're going to buy the, die, die, die by the sword. So there are consequences to your actions. Put your sword up. That's lesson one. The next sentence, he says, Do you think that I can't call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Lesson number two. Peter, do you really think I'm out of control and I need you to swing a sword? Did you not just see what I did When I just said my name, they all fell down. I let them get back up. This is all running according to my father's plan. I'm in control. I can snap my fingers and this is over right now. If I just ask God, boom, he'll send the angels. But but, but I don't want that to happen. I'm allowing this arrest and you're in here swinging a sword like you're gonna save the day. Back off, Peter. And then, verse 54, But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? In other words, Peter, you're interrupting God's plan. It's already written in God's word. It's already been prophesied about. This is going to happen, and you don't need to try to derail it. The word has spoken. My father has spoken. I just prayed for three hours, and he said this is the way it's going to go down. So get out of the way. Again, all this, just, you know, there's a three-point sermon for Peter from Jesus. Um, and, and, and there's still more. Luke, Luke tells us a little bit about this dude that has his ear lopped off, right? Uh, Luke twenty two fifty one. 51, it says, but Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. I mean, if there was not enough going on in this day, and then in this night, and in this, in this moment, Jesus performs a miracle and heals a guy's ear. So there's so much going on. Keep in mind, Jesus is ready to be arrested and to go with them, but his disciples want to fight. Ears are flying all over the place. Miracles are happening. And we finally start to see that as Jesus is being restrained, I don't know if they restrain him this way or this way or whatever, But as he's being restrained, uh, now he wants to have a conversation with these guys. Not his disciples, but with the uh, crowd or the mob that's arresting him. And so he says in verse 48, Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you, teaching in the temple courts, and you didn't arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. So what is Jesus saying here? Well, he's simply pointing out that this makes no sense whatsoever for these guys, right? I mean, Jesus knows. He's like, this doesn't make any sense. And he's calling them out on something. But Jesus also ends with, but there, there was prophecy that it was going to happen this way, so it's going to happen this way. But, but what he's pointing out is, why the size of the group that you have with all these weapons coming at me, a nonviolent person, 
Why the timing? It's in the middle of the night, early morning hours, you know, two, three o'clock in the morning, right? Why now? Uh, why would you walk all the way from the city of Jerusalem down through the Kidron Valley up into the Mount of Olives into this little garden when every day I'm two feet from you? And Jesus isn't really looking to figure something out. In a not-so-subtle way, Jesus is pointing out the hypocrisy of this group and the cowardice of this group that this is really all about them losing power and control, and they're pretty pathetic. But it's no surprise to him, and he will go with them. And so uh, we get to verse 50. And verse 50 is such a sobering, uh, you know, it's like it's short, but this powerful reality that just resonates when you think about it. Look at verse 50. Then everyone deserted him and fled. It's like this is like a moment. This is it right here. Like this is the moment where in complete uh, not solidarity, in complete, I don't know what the word, aloneness, I'm making up that word, um, Jesus will have to go the rest of the way to the cross alone. Everyone deserted him and fled. Everyone, all of his friends are gone. So literally in this moment of arresting Jesus, the moment they seemed to get their hands on Jesus and it was kind of like, well, Jesus isn't fighting, you get the idea that this crowd then would turn to the disciples and maybe let's just arrest them all, but they aren't going to stick around uh, and they're and they're going to, you know, uh, th- they're going to split, right? Th- they have a self-preservation thing that kicks in at this moment. No matter what they think in their head, their loyalties are, they split. And remember, Jesus predicted this just an hour or two. Well, it would be about three hours earlier to them on the walk into the garden. The sheep will be struck. Uh, not, not the sheep, the shepherd will be struck and the sheep will be scattered. And he even told them this, but they are all taking off. One by one, they're running into the darkness trying not to get caught. And now Jesus is literally alone. And, and remember, I mean, it's alone, alone, because like that crowd that celebrated Jesus' arrival into Jerusalem, they're nowhere to be found. They, they, you'll discover they've now all turned on Jesus or they will turn on Jesus, but they're not around. They're not following him. Um, His family isn't there. Uh, His disciples now have left. He's literally alone. And and, and we're going to come back to that, but that just, I want that to settle in. And every time I look at that verse, verse 50, it's like, how do I explain it? What do I say? And it's like, I don't know. It kind of says it all. Then everyone deserted him and fled. He's alone. Now this section uh, in Mark, uh, ends with a fascinating detail that's completely unique to Mark. In other words, it's not in any of the other Gospels. Look at verse 51 and 52, and notice how strange this is, and I'll explain why it's so strange. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. Okay? When they seized him, uh, this young man, not Jesus, but when they seized this young man who was following Jesus, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. This seems to be such a strange detail to the story, right? Because if you think of it this way, why in the world would this be there? Who cares about a random young man and what he did in this moment, if you're telling a story about Jesus and how he was betrayed by one of his disciples and how the Jewish religious uh, you know, leaders wanted Jesus dead and how all of his disciples uh, deserted him and Jesus was left completely alone, and that's your objective, and you've already covered all the main players and how they played a role 
in this night event, and you have Jesus alone and under arrest, why the need to say, and oh, by the way, another random person, well, he, he bailed on Jesus too. He ran away. He, 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 he uh, you know, was following Jesus, but when they grabbed him, he decided to go. Why throw that detail in there? And remember, no other gospel uh, account covers this detail. Well, the only reason you would do that is if you were trying to highlight something very significant. See, some people believe, and I am one of them, that this is Mark who wrote this gospel talking about himself as a young man who was there that night. Remember, I've told you over and over again that Mark did not, he wasn't a disciple of Jesus. Peter was, and Mark and Peter were friends, and Peter gave Mark all the information we've been reading for the last year. All of this came from Peter to Mark. Mark wasn't there. But now, there's this random mention of a young man there. There's no reason for it to be there unless it's Mark indicating I was there, and I bailed on Jesus too. And that's what he's telling us. Some people refer to it as like a paint, not a painter, uh, yeah, a painter's signature, uh, you know, uh, moment. Like when painters paint a picture, they'll sign their name in the corner in the, you know, and you can barely see it. Uh, sometimes paint, uh, you know, artists will put themselves in the background crowd of faces or sitting on a bench when they're doing a park scene, and that's them in it, you know. And it's like, this is Mark's way of uh, identifying himself in this story. You remember I told you John, when John writes his gospel, he never refers to himself. He says, and the one that Jesus loved instead of, and I was there. So Mark hasn't been in any of this, but here he is. And, and let me give you some support why I uh, believe this and why most people believe that this was Mark as well. Um, the upper room uh, that we talked about them having the Passover meal, uh, that was in Jerusalem, and that is believed to be Mark's house, his mother's house. His mother was a wealthy lady. We know about Mark's family. Remember, Mark goes by John Mark. He's called Mark and John Mark throughout the Bible. Um, but when you get all the way to the book of Acts and the early church, right, after Jesus uh, dies, resurrects, and then ascends, and the disciples launch into the church, uh, the headquarters they go to and meet at often is Mark's mother's house. They're wealthy, and so some believe that the upper room was in that house. And so the idea is that when Judas got up from that meal, the Passover meal, um, and he left, he went and got, you know, the people, and then he brought them back to the house where they were having the meal. But by that time, Jesus and the disciples had gotten up from the table and made their way to the Mount of Olives. Well, when they came back to the house, this is speculation, but it fits. When they came back to the house, you know, they're looking to arrest Jesus and it causes a commotion and it wakes up a young teenage boy, John Mark. And he's in a, a nightgown, if you will, a linen cloth. He's not fully dressed. And he wakes up, and I mean, he, he, he knows Jesus, he's seen Jesus, he, 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 you know, but he's not a disciple, and these are his friends. And so he follows them, and then he makes it to the garden. And evidently, this young man, everybody deserted Jesus, but the last one to desert him is some young man wearing nothing but a linen garment, and he was following Jesus. And that would suggest that this is after everybody else is split and Jesus has been arrested and he's following Jesus as he's being walked back into the city. And maybe he got too close and people are like, who are you and why are you trying to get... And they try to grab him and he's just trying to get out of, you know, getting, getting arrested or, or grabbed and he runs out of his, you know, outer garment naked and flees. It's, it's fascinating and most people believe that's... The, the case, but, and, and I believe that's the situation. And that means Mark is inserting himself here and trying to tell us that even he deserted Jesus in Jesus' moment of need, which he doesn't have to tell us that. 
There's not much other reason to make sense of why this would be added in this account and this account only. Now, here's where it gets even more fascinating. Years later, after Jesus ascends back up into heaven and the early church starts, we talked about missions earlier, and I talked about, you know, missions started in, in, in the book of Acts. Paul and Barnabas went on a mission, uh, missionary journey, and they took with them Mark. Uh, Mark and Barnabas are cousins. And so Mark goes on this missionary journey, and while they're doing the work, things aren't going too well. The Apostle Paul's leading the trip, and there's just not a lot of fruit. There's a lot of discouragement. There's a lot of resistance. And in the midst of that, John Mark quits and bails and says, I'm out of here, and runs. And that ticks off the Apostle Paul. So much that the conflict is recorded in Scripture in the book of Acts. So let me just read this to you. It's like a little drama here. Acts 15, verse 36 to 40. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. I don't want this joker with us again. He bailed on. He's a quitter. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Paul and Barnabas couldn't be friends for a while because Barnabas wanted John Mark to go, and Paul's like, I'm not working with that guy again. And so Barnabas took Mark, and they went to Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas, and they left and went in a different direction. These are all the men of God that we think are like saints and stuff. It's just, they're just like us. They are just like us. But we see a theme here, don't we, in Mark's life. Mark seems to be fearful, uncommitted, and a quitter. This is a theme in his life. But, guess what? He turns it around. He eventually turns it around. How do we know? Well, we know because later, when Paul is in prison, and his life is in a really bad spot because, you know, they, 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 don't, they, you know, they don't like him and he's preaching God's word and they've imprisoned him. He writes a letter and in the letter in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, he writes, only Luke is with me. He's just talking about like what a bad situation he's in. He, only Luke is left. He's been talking about people bailing on him and deserting him. But Luke is with me. But get Mark and bring him with you because he's helpful to me in my ministry. Which that's an indication that they built a bridge, and they had settled whatever that sharp disagreement was with you know, Barnabas being offended, and everybody's upset because Paul says he was a quitter. Once you're a quitter, you're always a quitter. I don't want him going on the next trip. But now Paul is saying, no, he's a great part of the team. And in fact, in my greatest moment of need, I'd like him to be here with me. I'd, I'd really appreciate if you could get him here. Well, that tells us Mark has changed. There's one other detail that we get to know that Mark changed over, and guess what that is? He wrote the first gospel. <laughs> Mark is the one that ends up, having not even been there for most of it, sitting down, and God uses him to write the book that you and I have been studying for over a year. So Mark is completely uh, restored and redeemed and used by God. It truly is amazing. I know that, I, I mean, I plan for that rabbit trail. Um, and normally we, 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 we're, we've been so focused on Jesus, but to, today we're, we're kind of ending here with this focus on, on Mark. It, it's truly amazing how God can transform a person. And I, I shared all of that because in some way I think by Mark mentioning himself there, it opens up the door for us to go, well, maybe we need to just talk about this. There might be some of you who have quit. There might be some of you who are uncommitted. There might be some of you who are fearful. There might be some of you that could, you know, even yourself identify a theme in your life of inconsistency and, and you maybe are so hard on yourself you're ready to quit because you've convinced yourself there, you know, there's no way God could use me because I pretty much demonstrated who I am. And I think you need to be reminded that God can use anyone. 
no matter how much you've messed up or how many mistakes you made or how uncommitted you have been in the past, you know, you're alive and breathing. Judas ended his life, right? And, and he spends eternity in hell. But you have breath in you right now. And you can say right now, God, I know what I've done in the past. And I know that I've been inconsistent. But I want to start fresh and new. I want to be better at my commitment to you. I want to be used by you. I want to be more faithful in this way or that way. And God can start changing you if you just lean into him starting today and in a year you'll be a different person in six months you'll be a different person in 10 years who knows what you'll look like mark went from running as a kid bailing on mission trips to writing the first gospel of the life of jesus so with that we bring this section to a close Jesus is arrested, and next week we will see them take Jesus uh, into a mock, you know, not mock, but a a setup of a trial uh, in front of the Sanhedrin where they begin uh, to hurl all kinds of insults and accusations at Jesus. So until next week, let's pray, and we'll see you then. Father, thank you so much for our time in your word. It's so fascinating to see all the different things in detail, and I hope that Uh, we all can understand this powerful moment better tonight as a result of this study. And so we just thank you for your word and the the way that it works in our lives, even when it's a story of great detail about something so specific as Jesus' betrayal and arrest. uh, There's still something in it for us that we need to hear and see. And so we just thank you for this time that we've had together. We love you. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Have a great weekend.
get it together That's what I say to me I put on the pressure You could do better Be who you're supposed to be But that's when you came in Right when I needed you You said I love the things That I was believing I 